I have a weird thing behind me. Can you see me still, or do I need to move? Um, if you could move, because mm -hmm. you're yeah. super backlit, and you're yeah, I'm gonna have a floral background, but so, so have you ever uh, have you ever gotten a flat tire in the cold? No, I can't say that I have. So what happens? I learned this today. Mm -hmm. Is your your tire? Is that better? Yeah, that's better. It's really a. Uh, I like the plant my... in the background. That's a nice tire. Yeah, it's a, yeah. You know, I'm I'm artsy. Um, but your tire will freeze to your uh, like the. I know nothing about cars, but you can take the the spinny things off. And it'll freeze to the actual truck. So I had to get a tow truck to like whack the like it physically like lift my truck a little bit and then take the tire off so then I could screw the new one on. Oh my gosh. I mean it's we're on we're better on the other side of it, but but still that's a that's a big yikes for the morning. Yeah, I mean I'm still here though. So that looks right. normal. Yeah that Okay. Your your background looks good. Okay, <laughs> great. All right, so we're recording. So let's start, right. let's start talking about your baseball background and then okay. how you got the process of getting to WVU. Um, so I grew up in a small town, Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. Um, it's outside of Harrisburg. Uh, played baseball, obviously, all my life. Um, wasn't really that good of a player. I mean, you could probably ask my dad, and he thought I was pretty good, but everyone else didn't. Um, but had a pretty good high school career. Um, and then I never played in front of a college coach ever. And I remember my senior year, I was like, well, this is the last time I'll play. Um, but then after my freshman year at West Virginia, where I wasn't participating in uh, college baseball yet, um, there was like a tryout in our local newspaper in my hometown for like a college league that runs from like the middle of Pennsylvania down through Maryland. And I just went to the tryout and fortunately, like made the team as like a third or fourth catcher. And then I came back the next year and did really, really well um, with that summer team. And I mean, it was, it's a weird league. Like it's like college guys and like former pro guys. So like there was like a first round draft pick who was playing in it. And then there was like a guy like me playing in it who wasn't participating in college sports. But um, so I did that for three years. Um, and then after the one season, I had a really good summer and I could always catch, you know, I was, good defensively and they kind of like convinced me like you should try to play at West Virginia um so I was like yeah I mean why not what do I have to lose so I just continued training um when I got back and I had a lot of friends who either I played baseball or actually had a couple friends who were all currently on the baseball team so I actually hit like at uh, Mon County Ballpark where WV plays I would hit at Milan which is like you know the facility in Morgantown um and would catch a lot of their bullpens and stuff. So I went to, you know, went to tryouts and had probably the best day of my life hitting and playing. So uh, fortunately I fooled them enough to keep me around. Um, and like I told you, I, I was actually picking up trash when Coach Maisie was like, hey, do you want to come back tomorrow? I was like, yeah, of course. So I came back and I asked him, I was like, you want, like I, they, I literally caught every guy and they were like, they were like, they like gave me a round of applause in a practice. I remember, cause I don't think they thought I'd ever come back. <laughs> they like, I caught for like four straight hours. And then I kept asking him. And then I think like the third day I was like, I'm just going to keep showing up until you tell me otherwise. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I ended up there. So what was the conversation between you and coach Maisie when you continued to come back to practices? Well, I, there was a, there was a couple, I mean, I actually student taught his son Weston. Um, so when I hit Weston had known that I was going to go to tryouts because I, I knew Weston from school. I was like, Hey, I'm, you know, I'm going to go, you know, to your, your dad's practice. And so he was there and, uh, and it was funny um, because I, that's like one of the first things I said to coach Maisie and he was like, Oh, like, yeah, Weston told me. So that kind of gave me a connection, but like, we would talk a lot about Weston, but I, I think like the, the conversations would always be like, you know, I think it was more of what do I have to offer? And I think what I kind of showed that I had to offer was I just was going to show up and work really hard. So, like, it, the conversation at one point went from, like, do we want him around to, like, how what role can we give JT? So, I, at one point, they were like, 
like, I think I, I had a legitimate chance for a little bit to be like a, like a player, like to play, a, like to actually get on the field. And then they realized I wasn't that good. And then I think for a while there, they were like, well, maybe we make him like a, like a student manager and like do some per like the BAPS program and all that stuff, which was starting to like, like video and analysis. And then at one point, like we ended up being in a situation where um, we needed catchers. Um, so they were like, yeah, like you can stick around and, you know, just keep adding to the team and catch bullpens. And, you know, that was, I was like, yeah, I'd love to do that. So um, we actually would have like, it was every road trip we went on, Coach Maisie would come to me. Like we, for some reason, I was always not by him on the flight. Like we'd be, I'd either be sitting beside Weston or him. And everywhere we'd go, he'd always make a point to be like, hey, what do you think of this place? Which I, I thought was really cool. Um, Cause I think he realized how much I appreciated it. Um, but no, it really progressed from who is this guy to kind of what role can he fill um, that's going to benefit all of us, which I'm really grateful for. Yeah. That's, that's really cool that they kind of initiated you into the program after yeah. not recruiting you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's why I always say like my, um, sorry, I'm, I pulled up. my, uh, my experience with college baseball is really different because then, the role I took on the next year was I helped with on-campus recruiting. So I went from like having no idea with how recruiting works to this is the experience you need to provide for a player when they decide to come on a visit. Um, and then I did camps, you know, at West Virginia university, like I helped, you know, direct camps and organized and planned all those and recruited for them. So, I mean, I went from like having no idea to like, Hey JT, like here's kind of get kids to come to camp, you know? What I mean? Oh, okay. You know what I mean? Like, so, um, it was a different experience, but I'm, you know, I'm lucky for it. I'm, I wouldn't be where I'm at without it. I know that's for sure. Were you in charge of the organization process or were you just kind of at the forefront getting kids into the camps? Um, so it really started with, I remember I was in the airport. Uh, we were in, we were at Oklahoma and coach Maisie was like, would you want to help out with camps? Like, would you want to stick around this summer? He actually asked me if, like, he's like, you can stay at my house. I was like, well, I have an apartment. Like, I don't need to stay at your house, which was nice of him. Very nice of him, obviously. Um, but he was like, you know, you can, ha you know, it'll be a good experience for you. Um, you know, it'll help, help us out immensely. So I was like, yeah, like I'll, you know, essentially that'll be my day job. Like um, we had a ton of camp. At that point you could do satellite camps. So like we were going around, like the plan was we had like 11 or so satellite camps where we were, we went to like Martinsburg, Charleston, Wheeling, you know, like different locations to run these camps. Um, but then what happened was our volunteer assistant coach, Robert Moore is one of my best friends. He actually left, like he, he took another job. So it turned into like, I had a lot more responsibility with these camps. Um, and then we hired Cody Atkinson, who's one of my great friends as well, who's now the Rangers hitting coordinator. So he's obviously took off, but um, for a while there, it was like, you know, my, you know, the keys to the castle a little bit. Um, I was still learning it, and unfortunately, I had great mentors in it. But, um, you know, like I said, I think we all were fortunate. I decided to stick around because they would have kind of been stuck between a rock and a hard place for a little bit there. Um, but, yeah, so it was mostly just kind of showing up and working hard. But, you know, it turned into, like, hey, you know, what are the operations going to look like and who's coming, how many kids, and all that stuff. So what was the process of going to the tryouts like when you knew that you weren't going to be actually on the team? Well, you know, obviously when you go to try, uh, like you saying, like the, when I went to tryouts. Yeah. So like when you, when you were continuing to come to the mm -hmm. tryouts, but they weren't giving you a roster spot. Yeah. I mean, I w I just took it as, you know, every day it was a, you know, an opportunity to be at the baseball field. Cause I didn't really take that for granted because I wasn't, at a program like WVU before, you know, I essentially just showed up. Um, so for a while there it was like, you know, just take, you know, enjoy every day and, you know, you might have a chance to don't, you know, don't, ex I didn't expect anything. So I, um, but you know, it was for a little bit there when they wanted me to like kind of take an off the field position, I was, I wasn't really interested in it, but where it turned out is we had, uh, there was a player got injured. They moved the player to a different position and then, uh, one like decided to leave so for the spring it was really like Ray Garini was our starting catcher and then Ivan you know Gonzalez moved to third so I was like I did like everything other than playing the game which was fun you know but I mean it 
Ray was like, he's one of the best catchers ever played at West Virginia. And I knew I was never going to play, but I mean, it was, um, I knew that there was value in it. So I just took it as what it was. I mean, I knew that I wasn't going to, you know, there, you know, my value, like my addition to the team wasn't hitting doubles and throwing guys out. It was getting pitchers prepared and building relationships and, you know, just picking up the pieces wherever I can. So what does that feel like to now have the guys that you played college ball with in the pros and in the minor leagues? It, yeah, it's, it's pretty wild. I mean, and, you know, you know, you watch them in college and you're like, man, this guy's really good. And then it just kind of confirms that, um, you know, it, it shows that the guys who really work hard, like, you know, like Chase Illig and, you know, like Michael Grove, who I, I you know, work with still now you know, and they're, they just work their tails off. And it's, it's just fun to see that, you know, I'm in a similar situation, obviously a different route that just, it's good to see that, Hey, if you work hard, you know, it, it'll pay off, but um, you know, it's good to have them in your corner, especially from like, they come, they'll come to our practices and stuff at Salem. And, you know, it's pretty easy to kind of teach guys stuff whenever you got a guy who's going to be a major leaguer telling them, Hey, you should do this. Um, But yeah, I mean, it's, it's just all because of their hard work. I'm, I'm lucky that I get to even just be around those guys. Yeah. I mean, baseball is such a team sport, but it's also so individual that you're creating your own stats, but you're also adding to a team. So were you watching those stats as you were preparing the guys? Um, I was I, like, you saying like now or when, um, when you were, like when you were at WVU. Really at West Virginia, I kind of just took the perspective every day of like, what is it that I can do right now to help? So like, it, it, I never really focused on like the stats or the, um, hey, like, you know, this guy's going to be our starting pitcher. I, I realized that like, for example, if it was a Friday night game, like I knew what like, you know, whoever was pitching that night, I knew their routine. I knew their routine. I knew that they wanted a water at this time. or I knew that like he wanted to throw a flat ground on the field or I knew that like he would put his jacket on because that was like a little thing to make it easier for him. You know what I'm saying? Um, but like a, from like the hitting standpoint, cause I was, you know, I'm a hitting guy, but I also knew my role with WU wasn't like, I wasn't instructing anybody during practice. So like all it was is I would be available for guys after practice or before practice. Now they didn't always take me up on that obviously, but um, it was just, my role wasn't as much like, Hey, what is, you know, what numbers are they putting up as much of like, Hey, what, this guy might need help. Like, what can I do to help him? Um, I would say now it's being a full-time coach. It's a little different where I obviously go to the numbers a lot more. It's like, okay, this guy isn't hitting, you know, fastball as well, or he's not hitting off uh, speed. Well, what can I do to program for that player at that time when I was, you know, still either below or on the same level as those players, it was like, what does this guy want to make him like kind of feel better and, you know, help him feel more confident when he goes to play. So, Baseball players are notoriously superstitious. What's the strangest yeah. pre-game or pre-practice superstition that you've you've seen? Um, that's a tough, that's a tough one. Um, let me think. I, you know, I've seen like stuff that's kind of weird. Is I've seen guys like, like they'll like warm up the pitch and then they'll shower, which. You can imagine, like, I can understand, like, after BP, but, like, you got to, like, you know, starting pitcher, like, they throw, and it's, like, 10 minutes until the game starts. Um, the guys wearing, like, the same socks. I've, I've seen guys who, uh, they, like, refuse. So, like, for example, if they say we played somewhere that was warm and they didn't wear an undershirt, they're, like, we'll play back home, and it's, like, 30 degrees, and they're not wearing an undershirt. Um, I would say, like, pre-practice stuff that's a little weird. I mean, guys would, like, they were injured and they had to like tape a part of their body and then like they were healthy again. They just continued to tape it. I mean, like they're wasting like 30 minutes of time to repair just to like tape their knee when they don't need it. Um, there's other stuff that's kind of more, I would say more PG 13 or R rated that guys do, but I don't, I don't know if, I, if they, when they, you know, if they watch this, they're going to know, Hey, he's talking about me. So, I mean, those are the only things. I can <laughs> yeah. Remember. We'll, we'll hold off on those. On those yeah, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you some other time. <laughs> No, but it's it's funny, like, when you watch baseball on TV, you can see the pitchers doing certain things, like moving yeah. their moving their hat or switching their glove hand, and it's it's interesting to pick up on those kind of things, especially at the major league level, because yeah. you see them kind of per- perfecting those things at the, at the college and minor league level. Yeah, well, I may have, like, so 
for me, like routine wise, like there's a lot of guys, like not as much superstition. So I actually teach, like we talked about this before, um, like different routines guys have. So like we call it how I like our dialogue is you have green and red light routines. Um, so like green, like I said, a green light routine is your go routine. So whenever you're doing well, so like the biggest, like you said, pitchers, like they'll, like there's pitchers who have like a mark on their hat because they always touch the same spot. Um, like it, it just gives them that like comfortability of like, this is what I do when I'm going well. So like we do it, when we do it at Salem, it's the only thing we require is one deep breath. So as a hitter, it could be stare at your bat, take a breath. It could be kick some dirt. I, I could care less, um, but just some sort of routine. And then every player has a red light routine as well when they need to stop. So the only thing I require is two deep breaths, but like, I think like the famous ones are like Evan Longoria looks at the third base or the, the foul pole, mm -hmm. uh, the yeah. right field foul pole. Um, Aaron judge picks up dirt. Some guys take their helmet off, you know, like you said, pitchers, sometimes they'll take their glove and put it on their, you know, they're not throwing hand. Um, but yeah, like that, I don't consider those superstitions. I consider those like, Hey, this is me getting reset and taking, you know, it's a routine that helps me get back to where I need to be. Um, yeah. So I, I've seen a lot of oh, my players better. I'll have them if they don't, if they don't do them. Then, you know, we got to figure something out, but yeah, it's a good point to pick, bring up. So what got you interested in the performance enhancement side of baseball? The start of it was just being going from essentially just being a summer ball player to going to a high level program, just being around the people um, and just being introduced to new things. And then we actually had a sports psychologist come for a whole weekend named Brian Kane, who he changed like everything we did. Um, we actually like, there's a lot of things that he did that I didn't like a lot of things that I did like as a team we did you know we do now at Salem that we you know some things that he did with other teams that they don't do at West Virginia they didn't you know um but he introduced me to the side of like whole wait there's a whole nother layer to this it's not just like I, I was the most negative person I think ever on the baseball field like I you know because you, you'd use that as a defense mechanism it's like in your I think probably in your genes to like tell yourself hey I'm not gonna have success here so then the letdown isn't as bad um but if you can rewire that where you're uh, self-talk's more positive, your, um, what your reading's more positive, you're surrounding yourself with people who, um, bring better energy. And like, additionally, your the information that you're taking in is going to benefit you to become a better player. It becomes a lot easier. So Brian Kane definitely was a guy who came and then, um, Cody Atkinson, who, like I mentioned before, he was really into me the mental game and Chris Dunaway, who was our strength coach, who actually was with the Los Angeles Dodgers before those two really got me on to like, start reading you know, they were like, Hey, you should always be reading something to, you know, make your, the sharpen your tools or to make your craft better. So, I mean, it was, um, like, like I reading, uh, start with why and, uh, leaders eat last by Simon Sinek. Like the, those books like changed, you know, like, Oh wow, there is a whole nother side of this. And then reading like heads up baseball by Ken Revisa or the, you know, the mental ABCs of baseball and the, all those books, they, they just wouldn't, have, I didn't even know there was that side of the sport or just really performance. Like you said, like, uh, you know, enhancement because no one ever introduced me to it. It's like, if you'd never heard a language, you wouldn't know how to speak it. So, I mean, it was, uh, th those guys were really like, those three really, um, helped me move in the right. I wouldn't, obviously I wouldn't be in this position if I didn't learn all that stuff. So. Yeah. I mean, Ken Revisa is an absolute icon in performance yeah. enhancement, but yeah. I, one of the questions I always ask when I have people on this podcast is what kind of sports psychology, um, mediums are you consuming is it books is it podcasts are you listening yeah. are you watching movies tv shows how do you get your information and a lot of them have said i'm reading the exact same books yeah like it's the same answer of performance yeah and books. so like i think it's um, really cool that you've thrown out a couple that i haven't heard of oh yeah um right now, like my next book is uh grit by angela duckworth because that's one of those books i feel like everybody like, it's like, I, I feel like there's a lot of books and she, re she's like in the, you know, the beginning part, like recommending the other book. I'm like, why haven't I read her book yet? Um, but like a, a lot of like, for example, like mindset by uh, Carol Dweck is one that I, that's about growth and uh, fixed mindsets. And then um, I, I read a lot of John Gordon. I've read all of his books. Um, anything Ken Revisa. I read Brian Kane's uh, one book. Um well, I've read all Simon's next books. I mean, th those authors are guys that definitely take the next level, but a, a book that I would recommend 
Um, so I'll talk about books and other stuff. Like the book that I would recommend to anyone that's in coaching or looking for mental performance is probably the, he probably transcended like how I coach is uh, um, What Drives Winning by Brett Ledbetter. Um, and then he has another one called what really matters and they're like short reads, but he has a YouTube channel as well where he's interviewed like all of the best coaches, like not all of the best coaches, but like, like Tim Corbin from Vanderbilt, um, Billy Donovan, I think his name, he was at Florida. Now he's, I think the Oklahoma city thunders coach. It's like Jim, uh, Jim Calipari, like coach K like Bill, like, like Bill Belichick, like, like, Dabo Sweeney, PJ Fleck, it's like all of these coaches and he comprised like all of this research and came up with like, this is what drives winning. Like he was like, this is what I came up with from like these hundred and some interviews. And I'm like, why, why doesn't everyone know about this? You know, it's That's like, epic. It's a, so it's like his, the three things. And I use this, you know, so um, start with why taught me you should first should come like why you do something next should be how, and then you explain what usually we, we'd explain it backwards. So like how our brain works is the middle is the limbic brain, which is your purpose driven center, but there's no language development in there. So like you're the purpose part of your brain, like why you do things, there's no like words. So like if you can explain why it becomes a lot easier for the other part of your brain to go to work. So like, Hey, like, why are you waking up at 10 AM? There's really not a good reason for it. But if you, if like, Hey, JT, why'd you wake up at 5:30 this morning? Well, I did it so I could read, work out, do, you know, do all these things to make myself, which makes my team better. Um, so that's what, um, you know, Simon Sinek taught me, but what, um, Brett Ledbetter taught me was the three things that every elite program does is they reinforce character first, then they reinforce process, and then they reinforce results. So they teach character, they teach process, and then they teach results. So those three facets, I actually have a graphic that I designed for this. And then under that, I was like, okay, how do I make that applicable to me and my players? So the why is our like team mantra, which is control the pace. And it's like all explained, defined. And then the how is all of our systems, our practice plans our, you know, why we like, again, like our, how we program for hitters, pitchers, position, play, everything. And then the results are the data we collect. So again, when I go back to do something, anything for my players or any, like I got to think, why am I doing it? How am I going to do it? And then what am I going to do? Because it makes it so like so much easier, um, for our players. So like, for example, every, like going into the next part, what I do, like additionally is we read a daily dominator that's by Brian King. It's like a one day reader and we journal on it. We write three things we're grateful for. We list a random act of kindness. We list uh, any form of meditation and exercise we do that day. And they're required to make their bed. So obviously I can't see if the guys making their bed and I can't see if they're doing a random act of kindness, but it's I, and then we do meetings. Like I'll do like video meetings like this, or I'll post on like, we have a YouTube channel um or meet in person obviously COVID era it's not really easy to meet in person so um so I I said this I was with some of my players earlier today I said you are required to spend anywhere from two to 20 minutes a day to make you better that makes us better so like you as a person not you as a player you as a person because how we define accountability is don't talk about it be about it so I talk about all the time how our you know our culture and, and is connecting people and that like we do things to make us better. Well, if our players physically aren't like taking the time to make themselves better, which makes us better, then I'm not being accountable. So then we all pay the price. And you can imagine what all of us paying the price looks like um, at a practice setting. So, and I guess I said to you before I run with all the players too. So, I mean, like if they really want to be embarrassed. They got to watch me run by them. So, um, but yeah, I, 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 sometimes I have to humble myself and hold myself accountable. It's like you did, you have read in two days or, did you do your daily dominator this morning or have you listened? Like I listened to John Gordon's podcast and there's um Jim, Jim quick is his name. It's, it's a uh, like K W I K. Um, he was a guy that had a traumatic brain injury and then like couldn't read through like college. Like it's like crazy. And then he like reprogrammed his, essentially his brain um, to like, it, it's like, it doesn't make any sense. It seems like he's a superhero. Um, to like learn more efficiently. So now he's a guy who like teaches people to like process like an entire book in a day or like people to like actors to learn scripts in like an hour. It's like super intriguing. So he, uh, he does like, he's like 10 minute podcast. I listen to as well. I would highly recommend him, but I'm getting long winded. So I, I apologize. I want to circle back and talk about 
now your time at Salem. How did that mm -hmm. come to be? Yeah, so I finished up at WVU. I was um, I was uh, finishing my master's, and then I decided to go into teaching, which, you, like, you came into my classroom a couple times, which was it's great. You played with some of my kids and Friend Friday, as we used to call it. Um, but they were fun. They were. It was, I, it was great. I mean, they loved you, and it, it obviously makes them act a little bit better, as you know. They're, they're, uh, they always like when people come in. They, you know, I, like I, I taught special education, and those – like socializing with those kids um, and you know it makes it so much such a better experience for them just to have people who are good people coming to hang out with them so thank you for that uh, oh. but uh, so I was teaching and then I worked for prep baseball report um, which I think I, yeah I their hat on and then um, so I was a director and a scout with them so that meant like doing clinics and doing events and I did some a few speaking events and then I worked at pro performance giving lessons like baseball lessons and ran some camps there and then I coached the Appalachian Aces who the team I coached we were a high school team that played college team. Um, so within all that it kind of with having the guys from WVU um, I kind of built a little I, I feel I'm, I'm confident in building community but we had a we had a community of guys that was like I looked around I was like holy cow like these guys are all pro and like advanced college players. And like there was high school guys in there too. I mean, but at first I was giving lessons to five year olds and then I like turned around and was like, I was like over COVID, like kind of pandemic break. Like at one point there was like, it was like eight pro guys, like six power five college baseball players and like four high school guys were all coming to hit with me. I was like, wow, like I, I'm grateful for this, you know? Um, but how that got me to Salem was I actually coached the ACES team. And while Coach Rouse, Coach Rouse who was the head coach last year when I was assistant, um, we actually swept um, Salem. So I took this high school team who I only coached on the weekends and like, we made a lot of progress. It was a very good team, obviously, but we went and played them and we beat them twice. Um, and Addy and I obviously connected and he's a great coach. He took this program from, you know, pretty much irrelevant to relevant, you know, and uh, you know, the next year his assistant coach left for a head coaching job and he called me and was like, Hey man, like, I know you're really well connected and, you know, this is what you want to do. Excuse me. He offered, you know, he interviewed me, offered me the job because I had other coaching opportunities, but um, nothing that really fit like what, I, like at Salem, I had full autonomy to coach the hitters and really make an impact on like the culture that I wanted to do. And then he, you know, obviously took a head coaching job somewhere else. And, you know, I interviewed and was fortunate enough to get the head coaching job. So what kind of culture are you hoping to instill? I mean, you've talked, we talked in our pre-interview extensively about the things that you were trying to implement when you got there. So do you have an update on like how that's going? Yeah. I mean, it's right now it's, it's more of a, I, I don't know if standstill is the word, but it's more of like mastery of just them being autonomous. So like over break, obviously we give them things to do and um, just doing their daily work every day. Like the, like I said, the daily dominator and the journaling and all that, but um kind of the identity that I want our team to have is one that, you know, whether we're losing or winning, um, that they just don't quit. So how we reinforce that, like I said, is with pace, which, um, so I'll, I'll kind of dive into that. It's the P is positivity, which stands for being an adder. So how that will either, I believe either you add or subtract, you don't meet in the middle. So like every environment they're in, they should add, um, and I truly feel like if you're if you're picking up trash, you're adding value. If you're sitting there feeling sorry for yourself because you're not playing, you're not adding value. You know, if, if you strike out, that's fine. If you throw your helmet, you're obviously taking, you know, you're subtracting. So, um, and then uh, a, accountability, which is the A in pace, is don't talk about it, be about it. So obviously, you say something, you you better do it. Um, and then again, it's like, look, I have to give you expectations and rewards, and then consequences. If you don't follow them, we all have to pay the price. It's kind of the way we do it. Um, and then communications, intentional body language and dialogue. So how we determine that is the dialogue part is you're not allowed to complain. You can't make excuses. We don't allow it in our program. Uh, if you make an excuse or a complaint, you must have three solutions, um, which I got that from John Gordon's no complaining rule, as you can imagine, there's no complaining in that book. And then energy is never let circumstance dictate behavior. So we'll just that side of it is, like I said, if we're winning or losing by 10, um, you know, you're the same person, you're still going to act the same. So I'm going to be loud and yell the whole time and have a lot of fun. But if you're a quieter guy, you shouldn't be, you know, I don't expect you to be me. 
but you better match me if that makes sense. You better match my energy in your own way. So like, that's like kind of like, okay, this is our system. So on each side of the ball, we have systems that we reinforce. So like you have to be on and off field in 60 seconds. Um, you must say three to five words between pitches. You must hit your routine, like your green light routine up in the count, your red light routine down in the count. Um, pitchers are 12 seconds between pitches. Um, but then additionally, it's like the, how we reinforce it is if we have a meeting, you must take notes and do this. Or if we have a, you know, if we check your binder, you know that you have to have this done. So kind of the progress we were at was we went from, you know, I would say 50% buy-in completely. So it's like, I think everybody wants to do the right thing, but they don't always know how. So like, you have to take the like, Hey, I'm going to take the time to teach you what we expect. Um, and, but I think where we're at, where we were at was we had over 90% um, efficiency and like the stuff off the field. And then by the time we had no one missing anything, because I truly believe it's like, you know, bad teams, nobody leads, obviously um, good teams, coaches lead. So I think I, I feel confident in my leadership skills just because I have great people around me. And also I know that I'm, I'm always going to be learning something. I, have to, I don't think there's anything wrong with saying that, that like, Hey, I know that I'm confident in my leadership skills, but I think we're, we took it to the next level was players started taking ownership of each other. So it wasn't, Hey, don't do that because, you know, JT might see it or, Hey, don't, don't do that because this is what JT values to turn to do. No, this is what we value. So we better not, we need to do the right thing. Not we better not do something. It's like, we need to do this because it's going to make us better people, which is going to make us better players. Um, so I think what's hopefully going to se separate us by the time we get to the season is we spent so much time, on hey this is this is what we do in uncomfortable situations so then when it gets easy um it really is easy so you said you talked about a 50 percent buy-in when you first got there was mm -hmm. it difficult to convert those guys um now when i say like so I, there's a term a friend like uh, a friend of mine we always use is I, I think a lot of guys were bought in um or they were a lot of guys were all in but they weren't bought in so I think if you spent, so what that means is like, they'll show up every day, they'll wear the uniform, they'll, they'll, they like posting pictures that they're on a baseball team. You know what I mean? Like that kind of stuff. Like they enjoy baseball. They enjoy, but when they're all like, they're bought in, it means like, Hey, are, you know, you say you're going to be a hard worker, but are you the guy who's being a hard worker in the classroom? Are you volunteering when we go to the food bank? Are you um, staying after to hit with other guys? You know what I mean? Like, so I, I wouldn't say that it's guys were like, un, like are trashing what we're doing or guys are, you know, they're not willing to work hard and practice. I'm not saying that it was a sense of, well, this is really different. Can I get by by not by doing the minimum amount, if that makes sense? So like, can I get by just being a practice? And, and I think the, the only thing, I think the, what kind of separated it was, is they had to learn like, oh no, this is, this is a, like, this is for real. You know what I mean? Like, this is actually what JT values. This is what we value in turn. Um, so I think it was just, you know, cause I always, I took it for granted at times where I was like, wait, this is my first year and this is their first year. Some of them ever being in a college program and on the other side of it, what we believe is an elite college program. This is the first time any of them have been on that, um, for a lot of them. So I, I, there was never a point where I was like, well, these guys aren't going to do what they're supposed to do. But, you know, the reality of it is, is the players and even the staff who weren't invested in what we valued, which is the, the things you can control are not with us anymore. And it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't a lot of guys. It was just like the guys who couldn't either, either um, weren't going to class or, or they weren't doing what they're supposed to be doing off the field. We'll never cut a guy for performance reasons because we're going to develop them and we're going to care about them. But ultimately, if you can't do what you can control, which is showing up to class and, you know, doing the bare minimum off the field, then you know, it's not going to work out. So how do you foster accountability, not only with the athletes, but with the coaching staff? Um it's something that I feel that I've grown in and I need to continue to grow in. Um, from a player perspective, it's just hammering down what the expectations are. I can't expect you to do something if I don't give you concise details as to how to do it is my belief. So for example, I need to take accountability. If I don't give them concise details exactly how I want it and someone doesn't do it, it's not, it's not their fault. It's mine. Cause ultimately I have to take ownership of this entire program. Um, so what I do is, you know, I send out practice plans, a, a week in advance for the entire week times what you're doing exact like detailed like four page practice plans i don't expect them to master it but i expect you to know where you're supposed to be if that makes sense um 
they know exactly what they're supposed to do with their binders because it's laid out. I explain it to them. Um, they have it. So, and then on the other side of that, it's like, if you do this, you get this. If you don't do this, you, it's not that I'm going to like necessarily, you know, punish you, but it, they, you have to know the expectation of what is required. Um, so, and you know, I mean, my background is teaching special education. I mean, you know that like if a kid messed up in my class, I, I'm not going to slap their wrist. You know what I mean? Like I get fired. You know what I'm saying? Like, I have to pause. I have to positively reinforce the good things. So how we positively reinforce it? It's like we really value energy. Like I said, we that's the biggest. You know, like that's the last part of pace. So how we reinforce that is at, at the end of every practice we give out a juice box. I know it sounds silly. Whoever brings the most juice, it might sound really silly, but there's guys at practice who are like flying around and are becoming better players, having fun working hard because they want a juice box you know what i'm saying and it's the most subjective statistic we have but guys perform better when they're having fun and they're working hard so um i would say the the biggest thing and there's no like i would say there's no like black and white answer um to like hey how exactly do you hold people accountable but i would say the only black and white part is that you have to have clear and concise expectations you can't be more clear like if i said like hey you know, I want you to, like, I want you to, for example, running the first base. If I said run to first base, I think everyone could do that. But we teach them exactly what it should look like, if that makes sense. Or like, hey, I want your binder filled out. I have to, I show them, I show them 10 examples of how they should fill it out. You know what I mean? So it's, I think it's just clear and concise expectations and over communicating. I, it's so fun because every time I talk to you, I just feel pumped up. <laughs> you're That's doing, good. That's good. You're doing such an amazing job at creating a community a community like you were saying i feel like every time i talk to you like i'm i'm so amped <laughs> so like i can't <laughs> i can't imagine like what being on a team that you're coaching feels like have you gotten what like what kind of um i don't want to say backlash but but um what kind of reviews have you gotten from either your your athletes or the athletic department? I mean, mm -hmm. what are people saying about what you're doing at Salem? Um, I mean, I think the people in our tribe, if that makes sense. So, like, they obviously, you know, I I'm pretty I'm 100 miles per hour in one direction. So, like, either you're you're jumping on or you're not. And we I use the term as either you're either you're rowing the boat or you're poking holes in it. So like if you're not rowing at all, like and this is a PJ Fleck thing. He's like my favorite coach. He's the head football coach of Minnesota. If you're just sitting in the boat and not rowing, like you're throwing an anchor down. Or if you're sitting in the boat and you're poking holes, we're all gonna sink. So um, I would say like if you're in our tribe, I mean it's only positives because we that's what we value. Like I said, we have no complaint really of this, but it's also an environment where if you have a problem, you need to bring it to me because I will I'll fix it and address it. So like for example, last year when I was an assistant, I had a player who essentially not called me out, but he was like, Hey, like we need to be more organized in our early work. So I had to like swallow my ego and be like, yeah, you're right. So I spent, it was so efficient, you know what I mean? Because I was willing to listen to my players. Like I spent the extra time to kind of meet them. Um, so I would say like in our athletic department has been extremely supportive because, you know, I feel that we do what we're supposed to do and we we're really organized and we've retained all of our players. We had no players quit. We have a high GPA. Um, now we, like I said, we've had players that we've decided to move on from. Um, we didn't have, we have, and you know, every college baseball program has really high numbers right now. We had zero players quit. We actually added players in the break. Um, so I think just the, I would say just from a result standpoint, it, they're saying that, Hey, we're moving in the right direction. Um, I would say even from the outside community, which, um, for the most part, it's, you know, that we're going to hopefully bring some noise this spring. I know I've fortunately talked to some coaches that we're going to play and they, I think they realize the players we have and how hard they've worked and we, who we've brought in and the staff that we have that, you know, we're trying to work at an elite level and hopefully it pays off. But I've also come to realize that, you know, I, you have to have that thought process and that belief that you're, if you're doing something that's different, like I think the phrase, I, like the thing I like, like if you're in front of the group, you're going to catch arrows in the back, if that makes sense. So like if you're running in front of somebody, they're going to try to pull you back. They're going to try to knock you down. But if you're way out in front of them and their errors aren't going to reach. So if you're willing to not listen to them, um, I think you should listen. But I mean, if you're willing to listen and be like, okay, I know that what I'm doing because I have a process and I know why I'm doing it, 
Um, it gets hard at times, but it, it's really easy. So like the people who are might complain or say, Hey, that guy brings too much energy or he's, it's all about him. They obviously don't know what we're talking. They obviously don't know what we do. I mean, they don't know um, who I am or what we do. So, um, you know, I, I'm really confident in what we do, but I also, but like I said, it's from a position of, I know I'm going to be, if I'm doing the same thing now in five years, I'm, I messed up. You know what I mean? Like I'm going to be doing something different because as you know, five years ago, I was, you know, a knucklehead catching bullpens, you know what I'm saying? So it's, uh, I really enjoy it. I, I and I, the other thing I kind of go back to is, you know, lions don't listen to the words of sheep. If, if you, if you're going to come at me, you got to come at me from a position of power. So, um, you know, that might be, I don't know what that, the word is for that, but you know, that's kind of what I live by. So these mantras that you've been telling your, your team to live by and live mm-hmm. through, have they come from your, your education background or have they come from the, what you're reading and what you're, what kind mm-hmm. of media you're consuming? It's a combination of both for sure. Um, I mean, the book Mindset by Carol Dweck was actually, we read parts of that when I was in school. And I think, you know, when you, you know, when you're in college, you're like, oh, I don't want to read this. And then all of a sudden you're like, wait, hold on a minute. Like sometimes I'm like, wait, I probably should have taken this more seriously from the beginning. Um, not that like you don't, don't take school seriously, but I'm saying like, it's always one of those things you're forced to read something. It seems harder. Um, but I would say the, I would say the biggest part is the experiences from teaching, like even my student teaching, you know, whether it was student teaching fourth, kindergarten, special education, middle school, teaching at a high school level, teaching severe, you know, autism to teaching behavior, um, strategies in high school. Um, so like with that, it's like, I mean, to be honest, it's hard not to go in, you know, when you're six hours in crisis with a kid, which means the kid's fighting you all day, which fortunately, you know, you're there, you're there, I guess the kryptonite for bad behavior. So like, Hey, you were in the classroom and they're all great. But, um, you know, those kids go through a lot. It's hard not to be, you know, negative. It's hard not to get down on yourself. It's hard not to bring a lot of energy to your work environment. So I would say like learning how to be more efficient where it's like being organized, doing things that make me better. So like reading and meditating and exercising and, you know, talking to people that are smarter than me. I used that when I was teaching. So now coaching is easy because, you know, it's my passion, if that makes sense. So, I mean, like teaching, I love to, I'm still a teacher. I still teach college courses at Salem, but, um, you know, it's not, it, it's a lot easier when you get to do like, Hey, this is what I want to do. I ha- I feel like it's my purpose that I have to, I need to get better. So my players can get better. Um, so like these mantras I find, or it's like, maybe I read it or somebody much smarter than me told it to me, or, you know, it's a combination of me applying it to what I do. Um, but I, I th- somebody always says, I forget who told me this. It's never, no, it's like you're, nobody has an original thought. You know what I mean? Like it's always, you've learned it from somebody or you applied it from something else you learned. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of the question I was alluding to how much of what you are implementing on your team currently has come from your mind or is it a Mm -hmm. culmination of everything that you've read? Because I, I'm going to venture a guess and say that it's the latter. Yeah. I I would say it's everything like the control, the pace and like the practice, like the practice planning and stuff. It's obviously from like picking and like from different, but like everything like pace is completely my own like mantra that makes sense so like how I got to it was from reading you know Simon Sinek's books what drives winning people I've talked to you know other programs watching PJ Flex videos you know what I mean like but I think the biggest thing is like mastery is in my opinion mastery is you can explain it three to five words or you can talk about it for three to five hours so I had to develop mastery on what I'm teaching my players before I could ever teach to them so if I'm using somebody else's mantra or somebody else's like process it's not my own so it's not going to be as efficient if that makes sense so um, I would say from a culture side it's applying what I've learned practically like from a what we do process wise you know like I use I've been fortunate enough to talk with you know with Chase me with the Yankees getting to meet with a lot of their hitting coordinators and you know taking their systems and kind of applying to what we do taking the systems we did at West Virginia and applying it taking the systems from the Rangers uh because Cody's there taking the systems from uh you know other programs and what I've done in the past and making it my own um so because like for example our practices are 
they're probably a little bit more like a football practice than a baseball practice. That makes sense. Like we're, we try, we want to make it as we want to be fast paced and then in a game it's slow. Um, our batting practice is a hundred miles per hour plus, or it's me trying to mess up the timing because I don't want them to get in a game and there to be any surprises. So I'm constantly testing. Are you, you know, going through routines? Are you uncomfortable? Are you comfortable being uncomfortable? Um, but I've never been in a practice environment like that until I created one, if that makes sense. So I would say it's an orig- like it's originally what we do and it's what I've come up with, but it's not because I haven't learned from somebody else as to how to get to that point, that point. So how do you approach consulting with a team? Yeah. So you have, you have I, a like, lot of different teaching styles. So how yeah, do you know which um, one to plug and chug when you get in front of an entire team like this? Um, so I would say it just depends. So like there for a while there, there were some college teams like coaches that might approach me and be like, Hey, you know, what are you doing with your hitters? And it was more based off of their questions. So it might be like, Hey, how do you program for a hitter who's doing this? How do you, you know, what do you do if a guy's doing this, that, or the other, um, in that situation to me, it's like, Hey, I roll out all of my resources. Like, Hey, this is, what I would do if I in your situation, you asked, so I'm going to deliver with that. Um, talking to like, fortunately, some of these pro teams that I've been fortunate enough to consult with, um, which on the one side, I'm like, why in the world are you talking to me? Like, I don't know what I'm talking about is what you think when you, you know what I mean? Like talking to someone. Who, but on that side of it, it's like, to me, I'm more open. Like they're, in my opinion, they're looking like, what can this, it's similar to like when I was at W, what is this guy going to add to us? You know what I mean? So um what that kind of looked like when I had some meetings with this one organization, I don't know what exactly I can or can't say, um, but um, like who it was, but it was kind of like, Hey, this is the topic we want to talk about. So like, they're like, Hey, we want to talk about how you, like how I program for vision and timing. The one time we talked about how I program for uh, like velocity training or how I program hitters in the off season or how I program, like what I do for this situation and we just sat down like this and I shared my screen and whatever I did and that organization talked about what they did um so it was almost like that in that sense it was like comparing notes if that makes sense yeah um and then the other situation I've really been in is you know hey come observe a practice and take notes and tell me what you can what you see that we could do more efficient. Um, I obviously don't do like that stuff for college programs really anymore. And it wasn't like I was making money on it. It was just like either friends or people I've built relationships with that I respect that obviously unfortunately respect me enough to, you know, not necessarily tear them apart, but tell them what they're doing wrong, which is kind of crazy to think about. Um, But now, you know, I've been fortunate enough. It's like some, because some of the hitters I work with, they've linked me up with some either private hitting, other private hitting consultants or guys who are in, coaches and pro organizations, pro organizations that have like essentially reached out or we, I've reached out to them and we've compared our notes, which is a lot of fun, um, which I'm grateful for. That's, that's awesome. So how do you maintain success when failure is such a huge part of the baseball process? Yeah. I mean, I think it's the way you look at failure. Um, there's either winners and learners. That's what that I like to say. You're not, if you, you can't, if you look at failure as like, I think the, the quote I like is failure is never fatal until you, you quit. So in baseball, you know, every at bat or every pitch, or I mean, it's another, you have another opportunity right after that. You know what I mean? Like you're going to have another at bat at some point. You're going to have another, if you take strike one down the middle, you're going to have another pitch. Um, because ultimately if you're really, if, if baseball rattles you and you know, if playing a sport really detriments your, you know, your energy and who you are as a person, it's going to be really hard when you're done playing. That's for darn sure. So um, how we handle it is I think just our systems, having the red light routine. We actually, like I, we have an air sequence. I think I spoke to you about this before. If you make an air, you do three things. Um, you own it. So you tap your chest twice. So that's on me. You pivot, you find a teammate, you make eye contact, you say, I got you. And they say the same thing back. And then you turn to the infielder off and tell many outs there are. So you then, so I think that we take a negative, which is making the air into a positive because the other teams like these guys are maniacs because they're like, they literally are now like, you know, they got better as a result of an air. The other side of it as a pitcher or another player, you know, Hey, that guy's prepared. He's doing what we're supposed to be doing. We have a system. Um, so I think just the overall, the, the thought process is if I make it, if I'm, and we fail a ton of practice, you can imagine if the pitching machines at a hundred, 105 miles per hour, 
you're not hitting a lot of balls doing damage all the time. Um, but it's, hey, I don't program for your feelings. I program for you to get better. So if you're failing a lot, um, you're getting better in the, in the process. I mean, like if you're lifting weights, you don't want to fail every set. But if you're getting to a point where you can't squat a weight, I mean, you're getting stronger because you're moving the weight up. Um, if you're, you know, you know, I think there's always it's forms of scaffolding. But um, yeah, that's really our process. You know, there's no winners and losers. There's only winners and learners. I and as I see it failure and mindfulness are so interconnected and you were talking about that how you stay present in the moment while you're also failing but using the mindset of learning so how is yeah. that implementable in baseball um I, I would say the first part is you have to practice it you have to practice it every day like if i don't so for example and i'll give you a practice example if it's if we're in a like a like a scrimmage and inner squad and a guy has two strikes on him and he shakes his head and come, like sets something under his breath and steps back in the box. I just go strike three, get out. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Well, the first couple of weeks, like first two weeks, obviously you're gonna be like, Hey man, you need to hit your red light. But once the expectations taught, I mean, you need to teach somebody that like, Hey, that's not, that's not what we do. You know what I mean? Like you have to give, like I said, you have to give them the expectation. You have to give them the system, how to do it. You have to teach them exactly how to do it. You have to let them crawl before they walk. Right. But the other side of it, it's, you have to hold them accountable to it. So like when we take batting practice and a guy swings and misses at two pitches, the expectation is that you're going to take a step out of the box and hit your red light before you go back in. Now, I'm not always going to be there to say to, but the, and I, I, this is something PJ Flex said as well, is like when you're in a good spot, your players are echoing what you say. So like I would always say, hey, like hit your red light. Now you hear guys saying, hey, hit your red light. You know what I mean? And that's where I was like, okay, we're now going in the right direction. Um, so I would say it's just how we make it applicable is you have to practice it every day. Like if there's a ground ball in practice and a guy does not hit their air sequence, we all pay the price. I mean, we're, we're not doing – that guy is not locked in, so we are all not locked in. You know, um, if, uh, you know, if a player – if we don't get it off the field in 60 seconds, we all pay the price. It could be one guy, but ultimately that's something we value, so we have to, we have to hold ourselves accountable to it. Um, because I believe character goes with you everywhere. So if the integrity and character of our team is that this is what we do all the time, then we need to do it all the time. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that was going to be my next question. How is all of this applicable outside of the diamond? Yeah, I think, I think having a why, like the, the like why in quotes, like what we do makes it easier. So like if you're telling me that being efficient and being organized and working hard and focusing on a character every single day is going to make you worse off the field, then you're lying. Um, even if you don't believe in any of that crap, at least, at least you have like, you're attaining skills and you're going to be fulfilled. I guess I would say happier if you live by that stuff. Um, at least you have a clear conscience if you know you're trying to do the right thing or if you're, if you're putting as much effort in as you can. Um, so how we apply it off the field is like when we do our like culture meetings, it's rarely about baseball. So if we're talking about what character is or how we define respect or how we, what adding and subtracting is, or, um, you know, anything that we've gone over, um, it's primarily about how that affects you as a person and then how it affects you on the baseball field. So like the baseball part is secondary because like, if you go back to character process result, I'm never going to get the result I want if I before have a good process, but also before that, if I don't reinforce and make the kid's character better. Um, so I always go back to that and they know that at least they should know that they don't know it by now. I didn't do a good job teaching it to them, I guess. So, um, but I would say it just starts with, Hey, life and then baseball. So what kind of mental qualities you were talking about the implementation outside of baseball at a college level, what kind of mental acuity are you looking for with youth players that you work with? Are there um, other certain would, things that you see when you're working with them and you say, okay, this is, this is a good step for the future. Um, I would say like coachability um, is a big thing for like a young kid because whether if you're eight years old, you're going to get a lot better, you know, ultimately, but also if you're 15, 16, you're going to get a lot better. So like, I would say the big thing is like, if I have a kid, cause I've worked from, five-year-olds to you know 30-year-olds um if you have a kid that's like a high school player and I'm at a showcase and I like what I like you know I see him and he's doing 
you know, something well, or I watch him and maybe he's at one of our camps at Salem and I give him like a directive. So like, Hey, try this, or, you know, maybe this would work for you. And they, not even if they master what I ask them to do, but they try wholeheartedly. Um, that's like a thing. It's like, Oh, wow. Well, this kid has ability, but also he has a, the ability to apply what you've taught him, but also he's going to do it with like, you know, I don't expect blind, like compliance, but I mean, um, obviously I'm teaching you something. I'm going to tell you why I'm doing it. So, um, I would say coachability. And then, I mean, I feel like this, these are such blanket answers, but like if they're willing to work hard, um, I, th- I think I'm a little biased because I was never like that great of a player. Um, but I always knew, I always knew that like working hard would help me. Um, and then at one point I got a lot better and it was a lot later than other people was when I was in college. Um, I became a lot better player as a product. Um, so, but yeah, and I was, but like mentally it's, you gotta, you gotta put your, like a lot of kids are, and I see this being at hitting facilities, a lot of kids are afraid to do things that are make them look bad. They're afraid to like try a new drill or put the machine at a hard velocity or fail in front of their friends. But the guys that are willing to do that every day when they go into a game are going to have a lot more success. Um, so those are, I guess it would be those three things. Yeah. So you seem so passionate about what you're doing and what you have been doing since you graduated from college, what is your dream job? Is it something like what you're doing at Salem right now, or is it something on a larger scale or is it mm. not even doing this at all? Are you looking? For um, I, I would say like, I don't look as much at like, you know, I want to be where my feet are obviously. And I, I try not to focus on necessarily like what's the title of the job I mean I always go back to like how my why is like I want to positively impact as many people as I can so if it gets to a scale where I can do a better job of that obviously I would do that like you know if the if the New York Yankees were like hey come be our manager which would never happen I mean you'd be an idiot not to do it but so like what I love like my you know like ultimate goal is to be a head coach at a small school like this and I've attained that that doesn't so that doesn't mean like but I think for me, the next step is how do I make this environment to like the next level? So I think the next level would be obviously mastering what we do on a daily process in our culture, but it's, you know, being a regional contender, excuse me, and then being a team that goes to a super regional and it's being a team that goes to the world series. But ultimately I think on the other side of that, you have the players getting drafted, players getting signed out of your, you know, your school. But also the biggest part is that when people hear us talk about us, it's, it's like, hey, they do, you know, wonderful things with those players and those kids and they make them better. So um, obviously I have ambitions to, you know, continue like what I'm doing. I don't know where it'll be. I mean, if Salem can continue to grow and, you know, be the place I want to be, I'm going to be here. But I also have a wife too. So, I mean, like she has ambitions as well. So who knows? Um, but I'm, I'm, this is, this has always been what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a head coach and I wanted to, build an environment that's worth being in and get better in the process. So I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful for where I'm at. What do you think is the most difficult mental skill in baseball to master? That's tough. I, I would, I would just like, we've talked about it a bunch, but I would say it's the like rebound from a failure. You know what I mean? Like, I think, you know, if you go, if you have a really rough day at the plate and then you have to immediately, you know, your position, you're going to come back up in the lineup and it always seems to be in a big situation. But on the other side of that, it's like, if I decide to take you out, you know what I mean? For whatever reason, it could be, you didn't run first or it could be, I just decided to put somebody else in. Um, how are you going to respond? Um, are you going to feel sorry for yourself? Are you going to blame me? Which you can, I mean, ultimately it's my decision, but um, that's not going to make anyone better. So I would say the, just the biggest mental skills, I mean, grit, toughness, you know what I mean? Like, Hey, it might not be my day today, but what now, what is my role to add? So I think that's going back to, if I get taken out, it's not going to add any value for me to sit at the end of the dugout and pout like for the team. I need to, how I need to add values. Now I need to get behind my players who are in the field. Um, so I guess grit, toughness, and just have the ability to, you know, flip the switch back over. Like, Hey, I made a mistake or something happened. Now let's move on and get better. Is there anything that you feel like I missed asking you about or anything that you'd like to add, anything that you'd like to plug about you or your program? Um, no, nothing. I mean, one thing I like to plug is, I mean, 
Yeah, hopefully if we can have people come to games, come to some games this spring. But um, I'm, you know, also I'm glad I got to speak on here and talk with you. I mean, yeah. I know you're doing great things for, for people and this is really cool. So I'm lucky that you even thought of me and I also had to reschedule and show up late. I'm the most time oriented person ever. So I feel like an idiot um, that I was, I was late. I'm, I'm embarrassed, but thank you for being patient with me. And, I'll hold you accountable. You know, yeah, you do. You do. I got I to gotta go start running outside my <laughs> house now because um, I was late. No, but thank you so much for sitting down with me. I mean, I've known you for so long. So having you in this kind of podcast scenario talking about what I know you're so good at doing is really cool. I appreciate that. Because like, that. I've had people from all over the country and a couple from Canada that I've been talking to about mental performance and having you so close is really cool. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's been, this is great. Anytime. And then I'll, I'll tell you when the, the podcast episode is out. I'm going to launch cool. them all at the same time. So like you can go in and listen to yours or you can listen to the other people's. I'm, I'm looking for right now. I have a bunch of mental skills coordinators and performance enhancement experts that have come on and I'm looking okay. to transition into specific athletes. Um, okay. I've interviewed a couple from base, a couple performance enhancement experts from baseball. I have a couple from hockey and now I'm looking for the actual athletes to give me some anecdotes. So like, I, it's going to be really cool. Yeah. It's, so I'm it's, glad it's that I'm really glad that cool you're a part them. of it. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm just lucky. I mean, people are going to be like, who's this guy? They're not, not going to make any sense when I'm on this list, but I'm happy. Yeah, I mean, um, You're putting I, something together really special. Let's, let's hope. I mean, there are so, <laughs> when I ask what kind of sports psychology, mental performance stuff you're engaging in, very few people talk about podcasts because there just aren't very many out there about performance enhancement. And so I think that that's, that's the arena that I want to be in because there's yeah. not really that much out there. It's all via books. Yeah. You're, you're like supply and demand. There's like not yeah. either right now, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like no, because nobody's like supplying it I guess there's no demand yeah. if that makes sense yeah so it's going to be really cool and I'm glad that I'm glad that you're a part of it excellent well thank you yeah if you need anything else just let me know okay thank you have yeah. a good rest of your day I hope your car is okay <laughs> it's fine I got I got the spare on there I'll get it figured out but hopefully it doesn't freeze on when I go to get it changed how cold so. is it where you are it's like 29 degrees oh. um yeah so I I I had got to the gym with it and then it, I came back out. I obviously didn't realize, like, I'm not like, you know, I didn't realize what time it was as I was, you know, up there. I would have texted you, but yeah, we got to, we got to figure it out. Not a big deal. Yeah. Have, have a good rest of your day. Hey, you too. Thanks for having me. Bye. Bye.